Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. And I'm really excited to, um, to have both uh, Aileen and Emily here um, from Colorado College, uh, mostly because I myself almost went to Colorado College and both my parents graduated from there. Uh, so it, uh, Colorado College is kind of near and dear in my heart. Um, and I'm kind of sad that I didn't go, especially now that it's such a cool, interesting school to go to. So I'm really uh, interested to hear about um, things at Colorado College. And so, uh, yeah, let's hear a little bit about um, who you are and, and what your role is at Colorado College. Aileen, do you want to start? Hi, everyone. I'm happy to start. Aileen Lowe, um, Assistant Professor of English, as Franny was saying. And thanks, everyone, for attending and for um, your questions later on and for the invitation to talk about hypothesis. Um, I am uh, new to the CC community, but before this, I was on tenure track and teaching at Allegheny College, which is very similar in small liberal arts college. Um, and Emily and I are actually teaching similar classes, right? So we'll be talking a lot about this first year writing course that, that is new to CC as well. Um, and I think that's, I mean, my, I'm, so I'm, my discipline is 20th century American literature. Great, and that's that's so great to hear. I love, I love twentieth century American literature. <laughs> we'll talk about that too, maybe. Emily, can you uh, kind of give us an idea of yourself and what you do at Colorado College? Definitely. So I've been at Colorado College as faculty since two thousand four. So it's been a while. Um, I'm a social psychologist, so I teach primarily courses in psychology, um, ranging from research design to specialized seminars at the four hundred level on social cognition and 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 um and stereotyping and and integrate relations and such um of course you know it's a liberal arts environment so we all teach um contribute to the gen ed curriculum so um i also teach you know introductory level courses in um in in writing and cultural psychology um and um i'm as you mentioned right i direct the bridge scholars program so that's our program for our first gen students from and, and students from um, minority and minoritized backgrounds um and it's a um you know they come early and 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 get get a class and start with leadership training um and other student life opportunities so um so i actually you know, back to the topic of being here talking about hypothesis. I've used this um, tool since um, late spring when we all made the pivot to remote teaching and have used it, you know, all the way from, you know, the, the, the introductory level class to the 400 level class. And, and yes, yeah, so I'm looking forward to discussing how it works in the different contexts. Right. That's, that's all really interesting. I'm, uh, I'm really interested in your field because I feel like I know less about it, Emily. Um, having read some 20th century American fiction, <laughs> I, at least know, I at least know what Aileen is talking about a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so we'll maybe talk about that a little bit more as we get into it. Um, so we organized the theme for today's discussion around this idea of college success in the sense that um, you know, when students enter college, they're not always necessarily prepared to succeed at, um, at the world of college. And I know Colorado College is a little bit different than other schools. And so it might be helpful if one of you uh, would explain a little bit about how Colorado College is maybe different than a typical institution in some ways. Sure, Aileen, what up? Oh, I'll, I'll take this one since I've been around for longer. So um, Colorado College in a way that is very similar to, you know, other liberal arts colleges that, you know, very, very student centric, very learning centric, right? That we do expect students to, to find the connections and, and, and through either, you know, by their own design or working with advisors, um, find the interconnection between courses that, for example, right now, you know, we are all in a pandemic, right? It's COVID. Um, you, you can't just have molecular biology. You need bi molecular biology. You need your organic chemistry and you also need your math and you also need your ethics and you also need your political science. So you actually need all of it. You need to dig into history. Um, and then you need to think about gender and ethnic studies, right? That, that it all comes together. And I think um, what we truly deeply believe in, 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 in this liberal arts environment is that let's help students make those connections. And one thing that, so that is, similar a lot of with a lot of institutions that have liberal learning as its heart but what makes us different is um that we have the block plan so block plan to those of you who haven't heard it before um is um 
one class at a time. That's the best way to put it. It's one class at a time. So we have three and a half weeks. We meet every day. We don't just meet for a short 90 minute period. We essentially have the whole day. Most people meet for about two and a half to three hours at least. They might come back in the afternoon for lab, watch a movie, continue discussion, but it's 18 and a half uninterrupted days without other obligations. And you finish um, the equivalent of a four semester hour class. And so that allows us to really get into intensive learning, right? So you don't need a week, a week and a half to warm up. We have half a day to warm up. And then by the night of the first day, you might already have, you know, 80 pages to read and four new papers. Um, by the middle of the second week, your first paper may be due. And so that intensity is very unique. Um, for us and actually i'm aware that a number of schools um out there maybe some of you participants i know your schools might have thought about how to convert to the block plan during the pandemic because um folks feel that you know if we can't get people together to learn for september and october what if we do two blocks of remote learning and then if november works out they can come back for a month right so actually i know more um more folks are thinking about how to condense teaching into the block plan so that's what makes us um you know a little bit different Thanks for that description. Yeah, that's that's really great stuff. Um, I have a long thought that that kind of, you know, the intensity of uh, the block plan could really um, could really be advantageous in, in some situations. I mean, I did sometimes find weird connections between the different classes that I was taking at the same time, and they would connect. But I always felt like that was something I brought to it. It was never something the institution was doing. And so the fact that you have these interdisciplinary intensive intensive classes really really seems compelling to me. So, uh, you know, maybe to kick this off, since we have this organizing idea of, of student success, and I know that, you know, in a, in a, say, traditional college context, you know, often college success or student success is like an actual course that people take often when they first enter the institution, and it might be like a you know, a one credit course or something like that and tries to give them, you know, an idea of uh, an understanding of how the institution works and some study skills and maybe some life skills, like a kind of collection of stuff to help them succeed as students. And I'm just going to guess that um, maybe the way that you think about college success and student success at Colorado colleges may be a little bit different than that, but I'm not sure. So, um, Aline, maybe you'd like to start off by talking about how you guys think about uh, college success at Colorado College? That's a great question. And I think especially for this class that Emily and I are both teaching right now, that's really key, right? And um, one thing that, well, I'll just say largely that one thing that really attracted me to, to teaching at CC was this, like, this ability to do really intense learning um, and the ability to, like, have sort of a freer schedule, right? And so I feel like with student success here, we're, we're really thinking about like the ways that they're also interacting with the community um, and thinking about how they can go out there and, and do things and how we can take advantage of the place that we live in um, as part of our teaching tools. And so when we, I think when we think about student success, it's not just about like in the classroom, right? We're also really thinking about the different communities that they're participating in and the different ideas that they're bringing in. Um, but but I think for the 120s, right, it's, we're, we're beginning, we, so the first block is them thinking critically, right, getting them to think about um, how to engage and to participate. And then the second block that, that Emily and I are both teaching is a little bit more focused on writing. Um, and so even in the way that, that we've sort of broken that up, right, it's about like scaffolding and, and building and then being able to make these connections as, as you both were saying earlier. So. I think success is really to, to help students understand like, sort of the next level of thinking that they should be doing here, right? And really trying to get them to become um, critical thinkers, which, which is hard because I think that, that we do this a lot in our work, but we don't always talk about it very explicitly. And I think at CC, we're really trying to scaffold that and to, to see how we begin to, to create that kind of um, student and learner and, and person. That makes sense. Did you want to add anything to that, Emily? Yeah, and actually, 
you know, I realize maybe the audience would not be familiar with what we, what we are, the, the course that we, had, we are co not co-teaching, we're, we're teaching at the same time. So as a part of our um, first year curriculum, right, all first years take these two units back to back. And in this second unit is really, as Aileen talked about, focus on writing, but it's also talking um, deeper into writing about um, how do you write in your disciplinary style, but also to talk about how writing in your discipline and in your own writing, but also in reading other um, scholars writing privileges and advances some topics and some voices and disadvantage others, right? So actually it does have a, um, a, a, an equity and inclusion lens even in the writing process. And so, um, so that, you know, when you talk about what is student success, I think um, for students to, to, to begin to see knowledge as, um, as, as, as a part of that culture of knowledge construction, right? That there are voices that are celebrated and that there are voices that might have been marginalized and how do they navigate that beyond just the conventions of, okay, do I use MLA or do I use Chicago? Do I do APA, right? That's sort of a deeper dive into their reading and writing that we want to get them started. The first block that, wow, actually every single class I go into in some sense have that hidden dynamic, the hidden curriculum of who's doing the speaking, who are we speaking for? Um, so that's exciting to, to introduce students to this goal. That's such an interesting point too, like to take disciplinary writing beyond, beyond just like what format the footnotes should be in, right? There, there, there's other things that we could talk about that are probably more interesting than what style your footnote should be in. Okay. Um, I'm, so I'm really curious now because, um, and maybe to bring social annotation in this a little bit, because I think a lot of us think of annotation really as a kind of exercise in reading. And this, um, this uh, phrase came up just, uh, I think it was yesterday. Wow, it seems like a million years ago. That's COVID time for you. Um, uh, where somebody brought up the idea of formative reading, the idea of um, reading as a kind of preparation for later reading and, and reading as a preparation for writing. And so I'm kind of curious how you guys think about um, annotation as a, as a tool that's really oriented around reading uh, and then how that then uh, pivots into the idea of writing, because it sounds like the course that you're focused on here is really a lot about writing. And so can you connect that idea for me about how reading moves to writing with annotation? I don't know who's, who, who should I'll go. go. <laughs> okay. I'll go. I actually think this is one of the things that I really wanted to talk about. And I think one of the things that hypothesis really allows me to do, like I really want students to understand that that reading is both a practice and also a, a way of building community. Um, and then when we read these texts, right, I, I make them really talk about both content, right? Cause I think it is important to understand, but also form, um, which gets us to think about like what Emily was saying about knowledge construction, right? Like, who is the audience? What, what voices are they privileging? What kind of research are they doing? What are the limitations of that, of that research, right? Um, you can only, like, what's in the archive, right? Like, not everybody's diaries are collected and not everybody was taught how to read and, and write. Um, and so it, it really is about understanding the link between reading as a practice, right? Like looking for all of these things when you read and then and then finding your voice in that, right? And really being able to be part of this conversation. So I think le reading for me is always the beginning of a conversation, right? You're, you're starting to understand where someone is coming from. And then as you're doing that, you're developing your own ideas and your own ways of, of thinking. And then you start formulating your own like, actual words, right? And articulating um, your thoughts. And so one thing that I've loved about hypothesis is you can see how the community is building, right? Like you can see students responding to a text and you can see them responding to each other. And then, you know, you can see them coming back and answering a question that they posed themselves <laughs> earlier. Um, but then also they're pulling in like definitions from the internet, right? And, and then putting in videos that might be that connect, right? And so you're really beginning to see the each of us comes into the reading with a different position, right? Um, and from there, we begin to to find our voice, right? And find a way to um, take what we're reading and, and doing something with it, right? So it's not this passive activity. It really is very active. And I think hypothesis makes that like very visible for us. That's, that's really great. And, and uh, Emily, it sounds looks, looks like you want to add something onto that. <laughs> If you want to move on, we can. No, 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 please. 
No, you were asking about how does the, the annotation go into writing, right? So I was thinking about um, the more technical style of writing for a psychology paper. Right? So how do, we, how do we help students go from reading to writing? So um, no, many of us who teach sometimes wonder, oh, okay, well, you've read 20 papers this semester, um, just go and now write a literature review um, in the similar style. But yet um, it's easy for us who are immersed in the field, right, who are experts to say that, but for novices, right, people who are just starting to be in the field, whether they're first years or whether they're juniors, um, they don't see that hidden code of how it's written. So in one of the things we do um, in, in my classes for hypothesis annotations is we use a hashtag um, that says hashtag deconstruct um, on the bottom for your text. And then, um, and, and when I'm some, so I would regularly in a paper that uh, will, will write, look, here is um, the end of the introduction where you see that the author has now summarized their predictions and laid out their two hypotheses, right? And after I say that, then I'll say hashtag deconstruct, right? In the later part, I might say that, ah, did you see that the authors um, mentioned this really complex procedure of, um, Alpha, uh, Cronbach's alpha reliability analysis. Note that they actually don't write a whole paragraph. It's just in one, in, in four letters, it's done, hashtag deconstruct, right? So um, instead of me needing to remind them in a lecture, um, it is delivered just in time, right? So they're reading there and then they see it. And then um, I could then make a note that, remember this, when you'll be writing your paper, this is a feature you want to note. Um, so I think that definitely makes a connection between the reading to a few weeks later when they need to start to write. That, that's a really interesting example. And actually that did kind of um, go where I wanted to go next was to actually just some of the more kind of practical things like, so maybe, and I hear from both of you, Emily first. Um, so you already gave us a description of one of the ways that you use hypothesis really specifically with this hashtag deconstruct, uh, which sounds really great. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, some of the ways that you kind of use hypothesis or assign hypothesis readings or assign annotation in your course. And then even things about like, do you grade them or how do you like encourage participation or maybe you don't need to, I don't know, just like, how is it, how's like the practical aspects of it? Like? Mm -hmm. So you ended with grading. So let me start with that. Um, I do a completion grade. So I did, I do tell them that I need you to put in um, depends on the course, right? Let's say six annotations, right? Substantive annotations, not the, yeah, that's cool, right? That doesn't count. I did describe in the explain uh, in the syllabus assignment section that, yeah, that cool doesn't count as one, but anything substantive, including asking a question, relating it to a previous class. So I give them a list of um, ideas for what they could say that is considered substantive. But what I find is that students, um, most of them go beyond, right? After, after the initial um, few annotations, they go beyond because they enter into a dialogue with each other and so they just chime in and lose count. Um, so the grading is really um, a, a small part, um, just a completion grade. But um, one example of how I use it is um, um, I use it to encourage students to um, engage in more, more sort of difficult, um, some people would say courageous, um, sustained conversation about um, about identity and inequality, because as a psychologist, right, some of the papers that we read relate to racial, gender, um, identities, and also discrimination and, 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 and prejudices. And so um, it's, it's a psych class, so sometimes the way we talk about it is quite technical. So I thought um, in, in the, in the um, online annotation is when people can combine the annotation with some of the personal experiences, right? So after somebody say um, a paper that we recently read on identity formation, right? Different ways that identity forms and different stages that people can be in. Um, I would ask questions like, you know, um, does this relate to um, examples that you have observed? You know, these are first years, so I say in your high school experience, right? And people will chime in and talk about, um, yeah, this is what I observed and it relates to that principle, right? So they bring the keywords back in. And I find that um, because it is um, asynchronous, um, more students um, have the time um, to think about what they want to share, how they want to share it, and they end up sharing than when we um, do a similar conversation in the classroom, right? When you have 10 minutes and you need to like, on the spot decide, okay, do I talk about what happened to me or what I saw in, um, in, in 11th grade um, while listening to other people, right? So, so the asynchronous nature actually allows students to be more reflective and um, be comfortable choosing what they want to share 
um, in, in, in a format that they want to share because they can choose the words. It's not spoken. So um, that's definitely one place where I think that we build that learning community, um, but also that um, intimacy because we can share and relate to our, our personal experience in a very safe way, I think. That's really interesting. Um, and Emily, is, is Colorado College um, all remote right now or do you have no. face-to-face? We have some face-to-face. -face. We have some face-to-face, -face. but um, courses that are face-to-face -face are more likely, more likely to be the lab-based class or the studio-based classes. Um, the, otherwise, the writing-focused classes tend to be um, remote right now. Okay. And how about you, Eileen? Do you, do you want to talk a little bit more specifically about the ways that you bring annotation into your courses? Yeah, and I will say because this class is um, a writing course, right, it, I think I, I used hypothesis differently than I would in a literature course, so I might talk about that too, but but all of our readings are PDFs, all of our readings are, um, you know, through our LMS system, right, which hypothesis is, is embedded in, which is really helpful. Um, and really, Erin and her team were great about converting any of my PDFs that were older <laughs> to, to like, um, to be hypothesis friendly, which was great that I didn't have to do that because we're, we're all at home. So I'm like, I don't have a, a beautiful scanner to do all of this work for me. Um, so all of the readings are, are PDFs on Canvas and through Hypothesis. And um, I didn't want to have lots of different questions for every new assignment that we were reading. And so we've had one set of questions for all of the readings. Um, and they really focus on, on content and then also really focus on form. So we begin with these questions like, what's the genre, right? Like, what am I even reading here? And, and um, what I like about hypothesis is that you can pinpoint those moments where it clicks for the students, right? So the question is, you know, what's the genre? And then, and then you know, following that is where, where, where was this obvious for you in the text? Um, and so I, I love the idea of the hashtags. Not only I didn't do that, um, but I want to adopt that, right? Where um, so I can see in the text exactly where they thought, okay, this is where the genre was clear for me. This is where the audience was clear for me. This is where the tone was really evident. Um, and then, yeah, we get to the more complex questions about, about content, like what's, and I, I like to ask the question of like, what drew you into the text? Because I think that's really important for students is I get to see what's interesting for them. And, and the thing I love about it too, is that I hear from all of them. Um, I mean, I, I signed it as a, Part of our participation grade so it's a separate grade um, but it really like Emily was saying is about completion and and I, had, I really I mean this is what's remarkable about CC students is like you don't have to really police them you know um, and they just they, they and they they bring in such interesting things right and I think I, I always come back in and, and say like this is great you know because I want them to really see that that what they're contributing is is wonderful as I think especially as first year students they they feel like oh my idea doesn't matter right or like my reaction is is kind of silly or, or dumb and, and and really it's not they're they're bringing in so many brilliant things and I love to see the ways that they're connecting with other texts that we're reading even though we're reading very broadly right we're reading from lots of different disciplines like we begin to really see how language is shaped by scholarship um, and we've been able to sort of hone in definitions of, of certain terms that we've, that have like, that have been, have been threading through all of our readings. So yeah, it's, a, it's like a basic um, reading questionnaire that they turn to. Um, they don't answer all the questions always, right? But I also don't think, I think that as long as they're thinking about it, that's what's important to me. You know, as you're, as you're talking, having taught a little bit myself, I'm realizing that it, it almost sounds like the annotation process has made you as a teacher kind of more or differently involved in the reading too and this the way the students are reading would you say that's true oh yeah totally i think that my teaching is a lot more focused like i i can see what they are having either trouble with or what they're really clinging to what's really interesting to them and and you know i think that's also like a it's a sign of um how much material is, is coming across during sort of lecture or discussion, right? Because you can see that all of them are, are attuned to this word, right? Like we read his text and, and it was talking about like fetish and fetishization. And then that term has like just come up again and again and again in all of our, in all of the, their annotations. And I'm like, okay, great. Like this was a term that clicked for them, right? Um, and so I think that it's, it's made my teaching, yeah, a lot more intentional, a lot more focused. And 
And I think also it's just more participatory, right? Like, again, like I said, you can, you hear from all of them. Um, and in a normal class, right, where we're just kind of reading things together or reading things on their own, like, I don't, I don't always hear from all of them. And um, I was thinking one thing that, that clicked for me when I was using hypothesis too was like, I've always wanted to sort of be in their head while they're, while they're reading. And I think Emily used the term real time, right? And, and um, actually we can do that now, right? Like I can actually see exactly where something like matters to them. Um, so I, I love that part about it. That I think that definitely makes me a better teacher. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, I, I love this idea where, I mean, I think, especially in the educational technology world, everything's so focused on, you know, making the students do this and making the students do that or whatever. And we don't always think about how it then in turn kind of might change what happens to teachers and teaching, right? Um, it's really, really interesting to think about. Emily, did you have thoughts on that as well? That, well like how it's affected you as a teacher? Let me unmute. Um, very similar to Alien, right? That that we I get to hear from every one of them, and and in addition to you know just understanding how they're learning, I found that it helped me differentiate um, my classroom, right? I mean, again, you know, at any classroom, whether it is um, as Karen asked on 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 the chat, how many students are in our classes? Um, at Colorado College, it's typically up to twenty five, so it's a small class, um, and I know that you know obviously with before when I was at University of Michigan, right? That the class size is a lot bigger, um, but but, but at any size, one of the challenges I always had is how do I differentiate? Even though it's a, it's, it's a course, I know what level it, it is. Um, some students would just come with more, more, more preparation or more knowledge from other courses, and some would be novices in this. And, I, and um, at hypothesis, by looking at their comments and their annotation, really helped me know, you know um, week to week where they are, what knowledge they have, what are gaps, and I can adapt, therefore, my um, synchronous teaching to what they do in a way that, you know, pre-COVID you know, pre in a regular classroom, I have no insights to that. I, I try to, you know, in the classroom, gauge based on what they say or don't say, figure out what they don't know and don't know. Um, this actually allows me before the synchronous class to now know that, huh, I think, you know, there were a lot of um, questions about um, the correlation coefficient. I will now spend an extra 10 minutes um, reviewing that concept with people in a way that previously I would just guess. So I think differentiation is, is, is definitely a, an outcome from it. And I think it is a very inclusive teaching practice, you know, given the diversity of how students, you know, have gone through the educational trajectory, um, what, they, what, what classes they took and, 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 and the, the, the experience. So um, yeah, I, I, I use it for differentiation to change how I teach. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I've heard this idea of um, uh, instructors uh, seeing annotations before lectures and then having that influence their lecture, uh, like you just mentioned, Emily. You know, I, I'm seeing a couple of questions pop up in the chat now. Um, one thing I, I saw, this is not really a question, more of a comment really, but <laughs> um, but I, David Buck, who's here, uh, and I know that he tweets pretty extensively about the idea of ungrading and different, different kind of grading schemas. Uh, he mentioned like the labor-based model and so forth. Um, and I, I'm wondering, have you guys experimented at all with ungrading? I mean, I think Colorado College, as you already kind of mentioned, is maybe a somewhat unique context in the sense that the students are maybe different there than they might be at some other kinds of institutions like University of Michigan, um, where their, their classes are bigger for one thing. Uh, but have, have you guys uh, thought about or experimented at all with any of the kind of ungrading uh, movement, <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about? I personally haven't um, incorporated that yet, um, but I do know an, an econ colleague who is trying to do that. So I need to learn, learn, learn more from her. <laughs> it's great that, uh, that it would start in economics. That seems like the, the least likely place. How about you, Aileen? Aileen, sorry. I haven't done it yet. I, um, I'm one of those people who's still a little too scared to let go of that. <laughs> um, but. I, but that, that would be a really interesting thing to think of through, especially using this platform, right? Um, yeah, I could see some connections there, but um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't yet. I, I wish. Um, yeah, David put in a, um, and you might put in some more links too, David. David uh, mentions that there's a, a, a hashtag on Twitter, ungrading slow chat, 
Mm. which is where I think I've come across some of David's comments on that's pretty interesting about it. And it's mostly educators talking about <laughs> how to do it and how to get less scared and, and, and the different practices and stuff. Thanks for bringing that up, David. Um, I'm also uh, seeing this question from Donald about <laughs> hashtag management, which is a way more practical, <laughs> like lower level thing really. But um, do you, and maybe this is really more for Emily because of her more extensive use of hashtags, but do you find Emily that you have uh, difficulty in like the number of hashtags that start to get spawned and, or how do you manage that? Not really. I think um, people have been polite and, 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 judicious in the use of hashtag. But I think it's partly because we have a smaller class size. So I think management in a large class would be different. And I think in that case, um, if, if, if I ever get to a point, right, I thought about it, if I ever get to a point when there are too many um, hashtags that we probably will um, have some convention about using of keywords so that there's less redundancy. We also um, on the site use um, Slack as our class um, communication tool. Um, and so, you know, between Slack and, 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 um, and hypothesis, I can imagine a conversation starting up in Slack and say, hey, let's um, use all use marriage instead of wedding marriage and, and be able to very quickly correct the proliferation. So, um, so yeah, ma ma very manageable. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of the um, affordances that you guys uh, benefit from have to do a lot with this small class size, right? Like, I mean, when you've got a community of less than 30 people, different things can happen than if there are hundreds, right? And I will mention that um, Hypothesis does have some uh, uh, kind of capabilities that might be more useful in large class situations, like in Canvas, at least, the ability to tie uh, the annotation groups to sections. Um, which can make a big uh, difference in a, in a much larger class. And like the, the commentary in the chat here, you probably don't need it. <laughs> you don't need it in a class uh, this size, right? Where you might use the same the same PDF like, like Elaine was saying that she does. Um, so uh, one thing that, and I'll just mention this quickly on hashtags too. Um, I've learned recently, um, after having met the inventor of the hashtag, Chris Messina, I recently learned that for accessibility purposes, it's actually kind of important to do initial caps uh, in multi-word hashtags um, because when screen readers are reading hashtags out, they can sense that the initial caps are new words. Whereas if everything is lowercase, for example, it's harder for the screen readers to know what's a word. Little tiny, tiny practical tip there, but I always used to lowercase all my hashtags too, and now I'm sort of trying to change. Um, yeah, so, and uh, I'll just I'll just mention this again, <laughs> um, Donald, uh, uh, or draw on this point that Donald raised, um, it would be this idea of having structured hashtags. So as a teacher, you might be able to say, define some hashtags that you want to use in your, in your course, like I think you have, Emily, and then have hypothesis sort of like enforce those <laughs> in the sense that there's like a pull down menu of hashtags that are used in the course or whatever. And we don't have anything like that right now. Um, we've done some experimentation around the idea of having structured hashtags, um, but that may be something that kind of comes into the uh, comes into the uh, software at a later point. And I'll just say that the way it works right now is when you've been using hashtags in your browser, your browser actually saves your personal sort of hashtags that you've used. And so they kind of pop up when you start to type them in again, but it's really only personal to you and your use. And if you move to a different browser, they're not there, of course. Um, so that, that's the way it works now. And it's not that structured, but it sounds like it's still, still working out okay for you. Um, <clears throat> so just a little bit of a uh, little bit of information more specifically on hashtags. Uh, so I'm wondering, um, you know, we've been asking you a lot of questions, uh, uh, of both of our guests here, but do you have any questions for us um, or for the community that's gathered here about annotation that you've sort of been wondering? I've been wondering. Um, I, I know that some um, professional societies are using using um, the annotations um, as a means for kind of collective writing, right? That you are writing a piece together and using hypothesis to actually tag it as, you know, like, um, red, um, you know, really neat revision, um, and then green, love it, and then they can put the comments associated with it. Um, and I have followed on Reddit that there are some sort of external um, plugins or, or just taking external that you can save the annotations along with the PDF, but you have to export it out. But it's not quite integrated yet. I'm curious, uh, uh, 
is there interest in, you know, we as, um, you know, in the teaching context, at, at the end of, say, Wednesday, we can download the PDF with the whole class's annotation. And then that PDF, because the annotations are there, can be used as a separate thing outside of hypothesis. I wonder, is, is that in the works? <laughs> I, I definitely hear where you're going there, Emily, and, and I'll, I'll have to say that it's definitely something that people have wondered about and thought about and asked about. And um, <clears throat> uh, people are definitely using hypothesis in writing contexts, um, especially when you're commenting on something that you don't have access to modify yourself. I mean, like I myself often, you know, edit collaboratively in Google Docs because it's such a useful environment for collaborative editing. And I would say probably more useful than trying to use hypothesis for that now, just because of the way that Google comments can be resolved and all those kinds of things. Um, but one of the barriers to reaching what you're, what you're hoping for, Emily, is that um, hypothesis and the, the text that it's annotating really, they're not the same document, right? They're, it's the, the annotations are like independent entities that just are anchored into that document. And so it's actually a kind of tricky technical problem to think about how to bring them all together and maybe say print them out, for instance, or you know, take a snapshot of them or something, although you can do screenshots, obviously. Um, but so I'm going to say that right now there's no uh, graceful way to do that in, in some sort of systematic way. Um, screenshots come closest in the level of saying like, I really want to see the text and the annotation together. But of course, screenshots are not text, right? They're pictures. And so they would be in that situation of like the PDFs that Elaine mentioned that uh, can't be annotated. And so that's not really so useful. So um, there are ways to export annotations separately. Um, and we're thinking about bringing that capability into the tool so that at least you can have like an external record of all the annotations. And each annotation, of course, carries the anchor of the original text that it was linked to in it, but they're not sitting on top of the, the original document itself when they're exported, right? So I, I'm kind of, um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to give a, a, a soft no <laughs> to that. And I wish it were different, but it's, it's just, it's something that we're, there may be a future where that can come together, but it's, it's a hard problem to solve and we haven't figured out the best way to do it yet. But what you just described sounds even, th that sounds fabulous already, right? That it is the record of what people wrote with the anchor uh, itself. I think that, that will be very important. Yeah, and, and we don't have it built into the tool yet, but um, uh, either me or one of my colleagues can put a link into the chat um, to a tool that our colleague John Udell has designed that is a tool that you can use to export annotations sort of outside of the app right now. Um, uh, and it's a little bit tricky when the annotations are made inside the LMS. I think it's trickier than if they're made out on the open web, but it's still possible, I believe. Um, and so uh, maybe Aaron or Jeremy can find that quickly or Franny. <clears throat> um, and I know that we're um, getting close. We got about five more minutes left in our scheduled time. And I'm, I, didn't give, I didn't give Aileen a chance to ask any questions yet. I've loved all, all the questions in, in the chat too. Like, you know, we, we have been sort of privileged that we have these smaller courses and I'm, I'm, it's making me think about how to make it work for a larger course. Because one assignment that I want to do for my lit class is to have, you know, a personal annotation assignment, right? Where I, I get to see how they're close reading one passage. Um, I, Mike, I have had a, I've been thinking about this a lot with this question of just like, um, not grading their comments, but using it as a grading tool, right? So having them turn in a PDF for me, and then I get to sort of grade using hypothesis. And, um, you know, I, I don't have advanced Adobe, so it's hard to make comments when someone does turn in a PDF. And, and I, I think logistically right now, it's hard to, to have all the students turn in a PDF file, right? Um, but I've been thinking about that more and more as a, as a way for us to give feedback to them, right? Um, and that a lot of the features that the students use now and that I use now to comment on our hypothesis PDFs um, would actually be really helpful when I'm giving them feedback and, and, and grading their written work. Um, so I wonder, I'm wondering if anyone has done that with it or 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up. Of course, a lot of people assume that if you're going to use annotation in an LMS context, the first use would be like giving feedback on student writing, for example, <laughs> as opposed to the kind of collaborative reading that we're talking about here. Um, and so uh, it's definitely possible. Um, and really the barriers to it now um, are really have some some part to do with the way permission structures are set up in the LMS. So interestingly enough, in Moodle, uh, a different LMS than the Canvas that you guys use at Colorado College, um, it's actually possible to give students the permission to upload their own hypothesis enabled readings. And so essentially, if I were your student, I could turn in my paper to you uh, for annotation purposes. Um, and then there's also, you know, the question of, you know, how, how, uh, how private those conversations are going to be. Is it going to be just a conversation between me and the teacher? Or is it, again, going to be like a peer review kind of thing where the whole class is involved? Uh, and so um, I, that is definitely a place that hypothesis will go. Um, and it's a little bit of a dance between us and the, the way the different LMSs work and just around the permissioning and so forth. Um, but it's certainly something that we, uh, that we are interested in doing. Um, and I don't know if any of my other colleagues wanted to jump in on that. Uh, I had noticed that our other colleague, Jeremy, also joined. He may just be like, like enjoying lurking in the background and listening. <laughs> but if any other hypothesizer has any comments about that, I'd, I'd love, to, love to hear them. I mean, there, there are sort of workarounds that you can do now. For instance, your students could send you a PDF and then you could enable it uh, for, for social annotation. And the only trick there would be like the privacy question, like, did you want the whole class to be looking at it too, <laughs> which could be useful and instructive, or did you just want to use it in a private context? Um, and in that case, unfortunately, right now, there, there's the problem of like, the only real way to have complete privacy around annotation between two people would be to have like private groups you know, you and each student in your own private group. And that's, it's a little too ungainly to sort of work out that way, I think. Um, and I noticed that we, uh, we got also a new question from Karen um, about, uh, and we've kind of been chatting about it. I see that you've been chatting in the, in the chat too, but about the students kind of response to annotation. And I have that too, because I have, like I mentioned earlier, I have a couple of high school um, kids of my own. Well, one's in high school, one's in college actually. And um, the one in high school actually dislikes annotation quite a bit. And I always feel that it's because maybe her teachers aren't assigning or using annotation in the rich ways that it sounds like you guys are. And I'm, I would be curious to hear a little bit more about um, your experiences with the students' attitude toward it. Like you've kind of described that they jump in and they kind of get started and then they seem to sort of take off. Have you had any like negative reactions to it? I think, I think, I think your intuition's right, Nate, that you know, it depends on how the assignment is structured, right? And, and that's in education psychology, that a, a, a novice actually has a hard time asking questions. They don't know what's the right question. And so if we just tell the students, go post four questions and answer four, then it is hard for them to ask good questions. They might not know the right level to ask. And I think um, if we can help by modeling what questions to ask, what questions to comment. So actually, um, I'm, I'm sure Aileen does the same, right? I, I promise the students that 48 hours before it's due, my annotations will be there. If you want to be way ahead of me, please. But otherwise, 48 hours ahead, you can start by looking at what I comment on and how I say, hey, look at this um, paragraph. The next three is actually really dense. So I would suggest, right, and, and we offer strategies. And I think if we do a more kind of proactive type of questioning, it helps. And um, to Karen's questions, right, that, you know, do the students like it? I actually, um, on Slack, asked the students last night and say, hey, how is it working for you? Tell me, you know, what's working, what's not working? Um, how, how should other students use it, right? I asked them very broadly. And they, they really mostly talk about the texts are sometimes very long and dense, right? And that um, I'm, I'm stressed out or it, it, it gets boring late at night when I'm trying to keep track of reading another 40 pages. But they all said that it is very beneficial that when they can see what others are saying and asking, it helps them know that their questions are normal. Um, it helps them break apart the long paragraphs to smaller things so they can pay attention. 
So they talk about actually it affects their motivation. It helps them manage their time. It helps them manage um, um, segmenting the work to, to, to do it with um, um, good in attention. And one student I didn't paste into there talked about that how she feels this close reading and annotation um, led her to increase her vocabulary and insight um, into the topic, right? So, um, but otherwise it's, it's um, they don't know, you know, how best to divert their 90 minutes reading. And I think that this tool helps, helps them. Yeah, I'll just add that, that one of the really helpful things about the workshops that we did have here, both with, with both one that was led by um, Aaron from Hypothesis, but also our team here that was looking at remote learning or distance, distance learning was that, that they were very clear about, about the fact that you had to have a, a very kind of structure and like assignment, right? That it helps to have a guide. It helps to, to have them look at very specific things, right? Especially at the beginning when you're just getting used to, to doing the social annotation. Um, and, and then I think from there, you can kind of keep fiddling with things, right? And see what, what works for them and what, what, what doesn't. Um, and also, yeah, you have to be engaged too, right? You can't just like throw this out at them and then expect them to do it and then not check in at all. Um, like, I think for me, it's actually been really fun to do that, right? Where I get to respond to them. And, um, and yeah, and I think a lot of it too is that you have to go in there and, and not validate their comments, but like, but, but be supportive of, of what they're asking and what they're thinking about and then bringing it back into discussions, right? So, it, I mean, we're, we all know this as teachers, right? Like it can't be a standalone thing. <laughs> like it has to also exist as part of the classroom. Um, and there are ways to build that at the, the front end, right? But then also ways to come back and, and, um, and echo some of those points in discussion in Slack or whatever else you're using. Okay, great. And I realize we're getting, we're, we're already over there a lot of time. You guys may have to go teach or something, so we should probably let you go. I, I saw that Melissa put in some of her prompts uh, or a question about if you could put in some of your prompts that you use. And I know that Emily um, did share some of the prompts that she uses at the beginning of the show. We, we are recording this um, and it will be up on our Liquid Margins uh, webpage. Friend, if you could put that uh, webpage uh, URL in the chat again so people can see it. Um, but I do want to be respectful of your time. Uh, so uh, if uh, I'll give you a last chance to say farewell, uh, Emily, and and then Aileen, and uh, and then we'll we'll cut it off so that people can get on with their days. Did you want to say goodbye, Emily? Oh, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to copy down, you know, um, some of the information on 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 the chat. So <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, and you can actually uh, you can save the chat. You click on the three little buttons, okay. and you can save the whole chat for yourself. Anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to keep it, yep. and Send and I guess you know, in my goodbye, then um, you know, if you if any one of you want to get get anything from my syllabus and and such, then email me. You know, you can find me Colorado College Emily Chan. It's easy to find. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. I, I really like look forward to hearing what other folks have done and and the. Liquid Margins has been really, really helpful in, in giving me some ideas about what I need to do too, or what I can do. And like I, Emily said, please do reach out if you want the, the questionnaires. I, you know, it doesn't matter to me. I'd love for people to be able to use them. Um, and I did put my email in the chat, but it's just alo at coloradocollege.edu. Um, but thank you everyone. This was great. And yeah, let's keep talking about this stuff. Thank you all so much for coming, uh, both both Eileen and Emily and all our guests today. It was a really great conversation. Thanks to my uh, co-conspirators here at Hypothesis. And uh, we'll bring it to an end then. Thank you.